Okay. Cool. It's legal for you to see this in Texas. I mean, Mexico. Oh, it's definitely legal. Yeah, go for it. Everything's illegal, or everything is legal. All right. Now I want to leave in about in about five minutes. So can we do this really fast? I don't know if we. Okay. Yeah. Just just we'll leave. Just just first. leave. Just leave when you have to leave, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically. Um, we went over time, but we're going to record some, some bonus material. And our question for the bonus material is, um, so like some people have an idea that like, uh, different people have like a relationship orientation. Yes. It's almost like an identity right. to be like, like I identify as polyamorous. I identify as a relationship anarchic or I identify as monogamous, like comparing it to like identities like gay, straight, trans. Orientation. Like, yeah. yeah. What do I think about that? Yeah. I mean, and there is a wiki page called socio-sexual orientation. So like, if you want to clarify it. That distinguish it from other kinds of sexual orientation called socio-sexual orientation. Um, well, look, I think I'm more poly than some people. Um, I'm kind of extroverted, although, um, you know, in terms of big five person analytics, my inter introversion has crept up, extra extroversion has crept up over time before like stabilizing at 50%. So it does feel like a skill I've developed to like relate to more people than I used to be able to. Um, and who knows, maybe if I was better at it in the first place, I wouldn't have felt it's so important to be able to develop this skill by doing it, you know. Um, you know, maybe some people are extroverted enough that they're like, oh, I just get social connection. I don't know. I mean, um, I don't know if it's as much of an orientation as an issue. I find that I, you know, maybe it's true of a lot of people, but I find it easier to achieve emotional intimacy and sexual relationships. I think that's true of men a lot. And that might be, you know, something to do with the hand that we were uh, dealt in, in like in terms of what cultural uh, upbringing we have from our culture, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but that might be an orientation. It could be that some people achieve intimacy sexually way more so than others. Um, you know, I try to be very agnostic with that kind of orientation thing. I mean, I used to think that I had a monogamous orientation. So I'm very suspicious of people who think that they do it because I was completely bullshitting myself when I thought that I wanted monogamy in the sense of an exclusive commitment. I absolutely I wanted pair bonding and lifelong commitment and, you know, romantic intensity and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that, that's part of my temperament, whether it's an orientation or whatever, like a, I have a romantic temperament. Absolutely. Uh, which is part of why I had to be poly because like I was saying, I don't fall out of love with people. And maybe that's a temperament orientation issue as well. But uh, I don't think, I mean, some people are also more controlling than others. But uh, I think that um, really anybody will be controlling if you don't stop them at some point in the development, like whether it's when they're a child trying to control their parents to get what they want or a partner trying to control their partner to get what they want. At some point, someone has to learn to not be controlling or they will try it. Um, and I don't think that's an orientation. I think it's an educational process. So I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone can say that. Well, that's just me. I'm just controlling. I'm into controlling people. I think everyone should grow up and be less controlling. <laughs> so I, I think that's, <laughs> I, I think that if you look at um, personality tests, uh, you know, Myers Briggs comes to mind. Um, there's actually a, a letter P versus J, um, that's basically like how much control you like to have <laughs> over your environment. Ah. Um, so you know, J's like to have a much higher degree of control than P's and they are about 50, 50, you know, spread. Well, to the population. you know, cause I took my personality metrics over various years, you know, it made me more P than J go in the P direction, education, going to school made me less of a J and more of a P because I learned how much I didn't know. That's really interesting. I actually started off very P and uh, I feel like I, I need to develop my J a lot more. So that's, you know uh, it's been, it's been a lot, it's been a lot stronger in the past few years. But yeah. uh, I used to be just totally pee. I was just like, whatever happens, happens. That's, that's cool. Yeah, so like first okay. orientation and personality are kind of like together and it does, they both can vary, so. They can. I mean, there's yeah. some things, like something comes to mind, there's, there's this gene where if you have it, then each stressful experience you have, like dramatically, like makes you more depressed. Mm. So if you, if you have the gene and you never get stress, and then you have like a low stress life, then, then you're not going to get depressed. But if you have trauma and instability in your life it, you get depressed you get very depressed hmm. compared to someone who doesn't have the gene and the depression just kind of accumulates over time every time you like you like there's no re, there's no way to get rid of the depression after you have the traumatic event it just keeps getting more and more depressed every traumatic event that's how this gene is reported yeah that's crazy Relative to other people. that doesn't seem wow. very adaptive yeah that, are, you, are you sure it's not just that i'm interested in looking into that you know swing is worse than for other people like it might it might be that you eventually recover from what I think you said, but if, if some people are affected more. The way I was, I, the way I was taught about it in, in my genetics class is you don't recover from it. Maybe, maybe that, I mean, you know, as much in, in, in mainstream, mainstream medical thought, there's certainly a lot of things that they've said you don't recover from that turn out to be recoverable or that 
might be beyond the boundaries of current treatment. So it's hard to say completely. I mean, I, I mean a major depressive episode can be several years. So like saying you don't recover might just mean you don't recover for a few years. Well, and, and my thought on that, if that's really a gene and that's really what it does, uh, my thought is that in, uh, in chaotic times, that gene would quickly be removed from the gene pool. It would probably evolve in a place that was uh, where life very, very uh, stable. We're, we're stable for a while, yeah. Stable. Yeah, yeah. It would it would only survive and thrive in a place that's stable. So unless uh, being depressed, no. unless being depressed is somehow adaptive. I, I, I thought it would be the opposite because the idea would be that like the risks are so risky that you have to avoid them that much harder. So that someone's hypersensitive because they evolved in a context that was even more threatening. Like it could be an adaptation to like. Like, for instance, people make this claim about why women have higher neuroticism, that like it's to like protect the infant or whatever, avoid the threats that are more of a threat to them than to men or something like that. Yeah. Depression doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to reproduce either. Especially yeah. if this is something that's cumulative and like gets worse over time. Like if most people are reproducing, like when we evolved while they're teenagers. D depressed men yeah. are probably a lot less likely to reproduce. I don't know about women. In a consent culture. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But that's not, unfortunately, how we evolved. Oh, wow. We have an Evo psych. Okay, guys, I'm going to drop off. Bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus. Good. <laughs> yeah, good, Bonus good talk with you guys. Yeah, thanks, I'll, uh, Chris. Yeah, great job today. All right, yeah, y'all have, you. have a great day. You too. Yeah. All right, bye. Bye. Anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, back to the whole relationship orientation thing. I think I, I generally agree with you. There's probably some correlations based on personality factors, but I don't think that there's a relationship orientation in a defined way like sexual orientation. Yeah, I mean, especially, especially when it's when it's about freedom, I find it really um, concerning to talk about in terms of an orientation. Like people used to think that some people were naturally slaves. And right. like we think today that some people are naturally subs. How, how far have we come in the reasoning? I mean, you do have to run the argument the other way as well and question the power difference of kink shaming. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a very delicate subject and one of the more difficult topics, I think, with relationship anarchy is how you, how you reconcile anarchism and kink, the and power play specifically, because anarchism is about questioning power differences and power play is about fetishizing them and like enjoying them. So, yeah. You know. I, I actually got into a big argument with a friend of mine who was trying to argue for like kink identities as a kind of like analogous to sexual orientation. And I, I basically, I felt it was offensive. It was, it was, it was offensive. Like, as someone who's like a sexual minority, like, so I don't what, think it's the same. What, what was the offensive position that they took? That, that, that basically what you just articulated, like being a sub or whatever, is like being gay. Oh, it's an mean, orientation. It, yeah. I mean, this is like I, 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 I've tried to be. Um, I, I think, I think I, I was, I was raised. Uh, almost too skeptical of BDSM, mm -hmm. um, like Bryce grew up from various influences, almost too skeptical of BDSM. And so I've like dialed it back a little. Um, but yeah, I can see why you would feel that's offensive. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's close to saying, it's, it's close in terms of what you might feel about it to with someone saying, oh, well, women are naturally submissive. It's like, oh really, women are naturally submissive. So what does that justify? And how is that going to affect your political policies if you just believe that women are naturally submissive? I mean- It, it does follow kind of logically. I mean, no, 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 nobody who was raised by my mother would say women are naturally submissive. <laughs> if you're going to say that being submissive is an orientation, you kind of do. But I mean, I don't know, maybe if, that's a tough question. That's a tough, I mean, a lot I of mean, people would argue, if, if a lot of people would argue that, that women are naturally My mother submissive. was one of the least submissive people I've ever known. And, you know, a lot less submissive than a lot of men that I've met, actually. And, you know, I understand that we're talking about statistics, so it's like one case is not the example. But like, right. when, you, when you have that lived experience, it makes it that much more glaring when you run into people being like, oh yeah, women are naturally submissive. I'm like, have you met my mom? What are you talking about? <laughs> and like, um, you know, and you can always ask, what's the motivation? Even if it's true, even if it were true, what's the motivation for bringing it up? You, you, you can still use the truth for a shitty political argument. You know, like, oh, this is a true premise I can use to get the, you know, kind of some kind of Trojan horse conclusion. Well, I guess you gotta have faith in yeah, I mean, I guess I, I felt that way a lot when people say stuff like women are naturally submissive or women are naturally feminine or whatever, like, because I'm like, well, I'm not like that. But I've tried to take it more seriously because I understand that it resonates with a lot of people's experiences. Well, I, I think, you know, I think it's more of a continuum. And I think, you know, 
you know, there are some measurable gender differences that are actually kind of small, but they are correlated with prenatal hormones. And I think that it's probably a bigger difference is hormones than like your, your genitals or, or your chromosomes. I mean, maybe there's a big problem, too, but you know, we at least know that prenatal hormones do make a difference for some cognitive gender differences. And like, there's a huge societal factor as well. You can undo that with, you know, you know, unfortunately we have a society which takes little differences and amplifies them rather than just like, oh, let's use a little education and give everyone more. Because you can create that equality of opportunity by like, if boys are worse in this subject and girls are worse in this subject, give them extra education in the subjects they're bad in to create the equality of opportunity rather than just saying, oh, it exists. So like, we don't have to do anything. Well, isn't that convenient? You don't have to do anything. Actually, you have to do something if you want the genders to have equality of opportunity. And I think we want that if we want the perspective of both genders on difficult problems. Because if a problem is difficult, we don't know who should solve it because we don't know what the answer is. So it's like you need to get, you know, different socioeconomic perspectives, different gender perspectives, you know, different uh, sexual orientations, depending on the question, you know, which kind of diversity of, you need a diversity of thinkers partly for the sake of diversity of thought, which, you know, they don't get in this like the, with the whole Google memo thing with James Damore ages ago, they, they always talked about the interests of the workers, not the interests of the problem being solved. And actually it's in the interests of difficult problems being solved, they have a diverse workforce because you get stuck when you have like a monoculture and everybody's thinking the same way. So like, <laughs> it's totally a digressive rant, but yeah. <laughs> it's been getting to me for years, that argument. <laughs> Literally zero articles that I found made this argument or even addressed anything about this when the whole James Damore thing was happening. It was like, wow, it's all about the people and not about the problem that they're trying to solve with the people for the sake of other people. <laughs> so yeah, I'm skeptical of it as an orientation. Just like, imagine if someone said political organization is an orientation, like some people just don't politically organize. Cause I, I see yeah. it as a route to political organization. So saying yeah. that for everyone, it's like, yeah, maybe you, not everyone's gonna as involved in politics. You know, you have any political allies or something. Another thing I wanted to bring up is I think people we draw a hard line between monogamy and polyamory, but I think that being in a polyamorous triad is a lot more similar to being monogamous than, I, I don't know, but like probably, the, yeah, be, being in a, in a polyamorous triad that's exclusive, like three people in an exclusive relationship is closer to monogamy than it is to relationship anarchy. And there are a lot of people in monogamous relationships who have like really deep community ties and friendship ties, which is probably closer to relationship anarchy than being poly and open, but you just have your primary and your secondary and you don't really interact with people outside well, of that. The closed triad is consistent with relationship anarchy if the power relations are like sufficiently questioned and justified, the ones that still exist. Fair. Um, and and I, people people will differ a lot in what they think is a good answer to like why should this power difference exist? So like that's where I think a lot of the controversy can be placed because people disagree about what is legitimate power and what's illegitimate power. Well, okay. What I, what I should have said there is I think that being in a closed triad is closer to being monogamous than being a free agent who's dating a ton of people. But people draw the line at monogamy. Yeah, and like I, I like to say, monogamish is not monogamy. You know, I, I tend to view monogamy as the pure term. And I mean, partly this is for a political reason. You know, you need a big tent party to have lots of people in a movement. And I think it's better to include more things under the label um, for that reason, to emphasize what people have in common. I think there are, because I think there are very few people who want literal, complete exclusivity in their lives. Maybe they want to hug that hot, per, hot person that they met, you know, <laughs> and they want, they want to feel that way about it when they hug them and they're going to feel guilty if they're in a sexually exclusive relationship, even if it's just a hug that they feel a little sexual about, you know, um, and I, <laughs> <laughs> we just, you know what I'm talking about. just had a about. long conversation about hugs. <laughs> we had a long conversation, we had a conversation about this. Oh, really? Yeah. Whether, whether it's ethical to get turned on by a hug and mm. not communicate that to the other person. So well, sometimes it's unethical to say so, I guess. Sometimes yeah. they don't want to know. I yeah, mean, actually. Is it, what, if, what, if, what if, is it ethical to suppress your awareness of yourself so much that you don't know whether it's turning you on? Because that's what most people are doing. I feel like if a guy had oh, okay. turned on, I'd probably feel uncomfortable. Right. More uncomfortable than if you remain silent. If you remain silent. Unless Maybe. you were already getting turned on. 
I mean, it depends. I guess you don't get hugged on from guys, turned on from guys hugging you that much. No, I... <laughs> depends how much you're into that, that possibility didn't occur to me. <laughs> it didn't occur. It's like, wait, I might like it. <laughs> I might like a hug. Amazing. It's like, no, it's just like, how do I deal with the creepiness? Yeah. Yeah, I would prefer that he didn't tell me and that he, like, stopped the hug pretty soon, you know? Like, I, if the guy was getting turned on and not telling me about it and trying to conceal it, I'd prefer that he not then go on to try to have one of those two minute long hippie hugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, different people do have different boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The starting point on that one. Uh, I mean, yeah, and then that's a question of like, how do we set like the baseline? The baseline. Not acceptable behavior. And, and how much Society. self-awareness are we expecting of people because, you know, people can often lack that self-awareness. Um, I said to a friend of mine who is, she was poly, but she had this agreement with her friend to not date each other's male partners. Um, like it was basically a hetero situation. And, um, and I was pointing out to her that this means that they have to frame their connection with somebody right at the outset to make sure they're not breaking the rule. Oh man, that almost becomes like sales when you have like a CRM in territory. Explain. Well, like, you know, like when, when people are, you're both working for the same company and you're doing sales, different people get territory oh, yeah, and yeah. it's like, you know, I've already approached that lead. So that lead is in my CRM for the, right. for the next six months. Right. But suppose you meet someone and you don't know if it's for yeah. a sales purpose yet, but you're worried that you might violate this contract of your company. Which or, you means, want, or you want to lock it down as, a, as an awesome well, option for okay. you. Right. Either way, you're framing it early yeah. rather than letting the relationship evolve organically and seeing is this a sales relationship with this analogy or in the original example like is this a romantic or sexual connection or is this platonic if you don't have this rule then you don't have to frame at the outside on the basis of a small information you can discover as the relationship develops what the nature of the relationship is but if you have to check at the outset that you're not breaking a rule then you're forced to decide early based on less information which again destroys information so i think it's bad for collective understanding to force people <laughs> to frame their relationships at the outset and be like to definitely decide right now if you're into this person like maybe you have to know them especially you know this is like a, a demisexual's argument you know, i'm not i go through phases of being demisexual i need to know somebody to be attracted to them but if someone's very demisexual then these kinds of rules are really oppressive to demisexuals because they expect them to figure out right away who they're attracted to and by definition they have to know somebody before they know if they're attracted i find the demisexual sexist actually sexist that's interesting why i can't guess why but yeah why because it creates the default of being able to be attracted to people without emotional connection, which is more common in men. Oh, that's funny, because I'm always looking, because uh, I'm always like, I don't know, is there a word for the opposite of demisexual? I just tell people that I'm at times not very demisexual. I go through phases of demisexuality and phases of being very not demisexual at all. Allosexual means not asexual, I think. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I think that's kind of like the default. Let's say like hypersexual. I mean, hypersexual. Is that I go through phases of hypersexuality and phases of demisexuality. I want to say like this, that criticism that you have to decide at the outset um, leads into my least favorite part of monogamy okay. <laughs> since I've gone back to engaging in monogamous relationships is I feel like there's this intense pressure for me to like decide early on in a relationship if I want to commit to this person being my partner. And I feel like I can't just date people freely, or at least not for very long, you, you know, like you can't get to a certain level of emotional intend intensity without a certain amount of commitment. And then you're foregoing all other options. And it's just like this really high stakes thing. Yeah. Right? I, and forced choice. Yeah, I, separation early, yeah. That really bothers me too, actually. That's a big part of the reason why I'm still like, to some degree, ambivalent about being all in on monogamy. Especially I find like, like when, when, when women are dating one another, it often just gets to that point like really quickly of like talking about like commitment and all that stuff and even like lifelong commitment. And it can, it's, it's just, it's just really hard to connect with someone when that's yeah. on the table super fast and there's not really a connection yet. Yeah. Well, I feel like it's like that more and more now too. Like just as I'm getting older <laughs> 27 now like it wasn't like that at all when i was like 21 or something and nobody's really thinking about settling down or like time limits on wanting to find somebody to start a family with you know but like if you want to do it within eight years that's a that's a that's a time frame that you should be thinking about when you're engaging in your relationships and that sets up this this whole odd dynamic but then if you were non-monogamous and it was like you were just kind of 
dating a bunch of people at once. And then, then it can create a situation. Um, I've had a situation too in, in non-monogamy where, okay, polyamory felt pretty cool when I had like a, a, a stable partnership and then dating people. And I had like a stable framework to be dating these other people in. Um, but then when I was single, more or less, but poly and like had some casual relationships, but was also dating other people and it was open. It felt like it was setting up this dynamic where like everybody was competing each other <laughs> with one another to like see who was going to become the primary. And that was not fun. Uh, yeah, that's not, that's not fun either. It reminds me of like a dynamic that sometimes happens in like non-monogamous relationships where it's like, I'm dating you and you have sex with someone. So I have to have sex with someone to like restore the balance huh. as fast as possible. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately that's more common in a mononormative society because you have to actually, um, there's more of a need to test a freedom to see if you have it, if the freedom is more rare. If, if we were in a society where like you just knew that you could do that and not quote unquote get in trouble, then you wouldn't need to do it just to find out that you're not being controlled. It's, it's not about the, it's not about asserting the freedom. It's about like it asserting is. equal value in the, I don't know, almost it's like about like proving that desirability more, I think. Yeah, I think that's kind of coming from insecurity. I, I never felt the drive to have to do that. And like that. I had the opposite, I would have the opposite concern in that scenario of like demonstrating the freedom rather than like the ones I mean, obviously, everybody's yeah. concerned about their worth and like, I'm desirable and all that. But it might depend on how much you've experienced controlling relationships in the past as well. Like, yeah, maybe. You know. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's just. Maybe that was just me. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to get over this problem though of like somebody selling elotes or something like that outside. It's okay. I can keep going. Okay. I don't know how to get over this problem though of if, if you are solo and like you don't have a nesting partner in more poly lingo, like you don't have somebody that you're living with and kind of building a home with and you're dating multiple people and dating them openly, you're kind of in a mode of like comparing and, and choosing between like which relationship is going to escalate more and everyone else is doing that at the same time. It, it feels a little bit, I don't know, especially if you're trying to do a type of non-monogamy or polyamory where your partners also know one another, it just, it sets up a very weird dynamic. Is, isn't it like that anyway for single people though? I guess it is, but like for single people, you usually don't talk about <laughs> the other people that you're dating, <laughs> <laughs> nor are they expected to interact with each other. And if you choose one person, you break up with the other. And like everybody's kind of expecting that. I don't know. I, I guess it is, it is similar. It's just kind of like quicker and cleaner cuts. The, the echoes of that partly induce the feeling of competition in the poly setting. Like I'm not saying there isn't also like anything zero sum going on there, but like the fact that people are used to that script from just because you know you're no longer agreeing to be definitely monogamous doesn't mean you're free from all the scripts that you had from like a monogamous culture and this idea that you're going to choose one person to be like the winner of the thing or whatever i mean you could just as easily be taking a collective perspective and trying to see like which groups of people get along better so that society forms into social groups that get along as opposed to forming the social groups that don't get along you yeah know? yeah i guess a non-polynormative I guess that would sort of be viewed as like a polynormative from a relationship anarchy perspective that would be viewed as like a polynormative way of engaging in polyamory whereas maybe like relationship anarchists would more like say there doesn't have to be a winner or well yeah I mean, do you like, mean a mononormative way of engaging in it no i bet polynormative i mean but there's a specific way to do poly yeah there's a specific way to do poly and then it's going to tend to it's going to ultimately involve like some kind of hierarchy of partners yeah, it's kind of polynormative, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess that, I guess that's true. I I don't think it has to be that way, but I think that's probably the most likely outcome. I don't know. Like it, it seems unlikely to me that you'd fall into like an egalitarian, multi-partner situation. Well, well, I mean, you could also you could also just not want to live with people and partner with people in that way. That would be another. Well, one, one big difference, and this is true in the political level, is how much intervention you think there should be to create equality, right? You know, I just think like, oh, we have, you know, all have the equal 
opportunity to do something you don't have the equal outcome in the relationship something that you might think oh we need we should have closer to equal outcomes in terms of how much of someone's time somebody was getting in a triad or something like that but that that's another place where i think there can be quite a range of opinion in terms of wow. that, that that balance that that in my in my experience that really backfires what does oh trying to create the equality directly it backfired with uh, soviet russia <laughs> yeah yeah well it just like trying to force equality among poly partners yeah what well, you can create... trying to control your emotional attachment to people seems like a, a bad road to go down trying to like upregulate or downregulate how much you like another person even trying to force equality of time like i've been in that situation or it's been basically like i start i started resenting spending time with the one partner and like hoarding or treasuring the time that i spent with the other one it just it just mm -hmm. it's not good well yeah i mean if, if you're if you're doing something out of mere obligation it does tend to produce resentment and like yeah um but you know there's a difference between doing something out of like a sense of obligation and actually like like your own preference being one of like looking at the what's in the collective interest you know um and you might think like oh like i'm not really enjoying my time with this partner this month and you know maybe they're depressed this month and maybe that's why you're not getting much on the relationship maybe you you know, maybe they need you. Maybe you definitely are not getting anything in that relation to this month because they're fucked, you know? Um, but if you're committed to them or, um, uh, or, or, well, it's some mix of committed to them or like you see that it's in the communal interest for someone to help this person and you're in a new position because you know them or something like that, um, then, you know, you're not going to just act out of hedonism and like, who can I get the most pleasure from? Because I think what underlies a lot of the issues of the casual sex and all that is the hedonism of it. Like yeah, it's nihilism and, and hedonistic, you know, it's not all about maximizing your good times and you know maximizing the value to you an individual even like the individualism i'm very individualistic about it I, I guess like with the poly thing though i just find there's often a dynamic of like there's just certain there's a, like there's often like a feeling of like if only i felt this way it would be so much better for the community <laughs> and so it's like i'm just gonna try mm. you know i think i do kind of, i think i do kind of feel that way you know i think this you know i think i'm there i think it's working it, and you eventually yeah, the back. Yeah. yeah. I was gonna say I think that's very true in monogamy though. Like in long term monogamy. Yeah. Like that that's probably the most common thing I see a lot among long term monogamous couples is they're like trying to like they're really trying to feel passion. So there's this uh. there's this phrase, you can Google this phrase, sexual communal strength. There's some articles in terms of this that say like in the context of a long term monogamous relationship and the notion is that for a successful long-term relationship, you need this sexual communal strength. Why? I mean, part of it's because of this notion of who's in a unique position to help. If if you're in this committed, exclusive relationship, that means that no one else can help this person with their sexual desires. What is sexual communal strength? It's well, it's basically like like recognizing that if you're in an exclusive relationship, you have some duty to the sexual needs of your partner because they're not allowed to get those needs met by anybody else. So you're the only person who can help them without breaking the rules. Yeah, that seems to be a pretty common notion. Yeah, now, and what I would suggest is that it's the same thing in a poly situation, but it's just less of an issue. You don't have to do as much out of pure sexual communal strength. And I'm not saying it's never the case. And I think, you know, some people, um, um, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, we're lucky now that, that, there's less that people have to do to pure obligation in their romantic relationships, you know, I mean, or, you know, that they're not even choosing because, you know, there's a lot of non-consensual sex in uh, monogamous marriages that weren't even monogamous anyway, somebody was mm -hmm. cheating, you know, um, and so it is a really dangerous concept and, you know, because sexual communal strength, sh sh you know, that sounds nice, but like uh, owing somebody sex doesn't sound nice. And like, what's the difference between the concepts? Well, it's a subtle difference, unfortunately. And like, it's not a difference you really want to be subtle, but like, that's part of the reason that I think polyamory is good for women uh, and for men. But to answer your earlier question is that um, it reduces that burden of, of acting like somebody has a duty to take care of someone's sexual needs, because that's if, if you know, because you can just deny that, that the sexual needs need to be met. Maybe it's true. Maybe people should grow up and not always need sex or something like that. Um, but um, to the extent that you see those needs as like needs and not just like preferences or something, um, and they're needs that have to be met by another person, if you don't accept the like sex robot solution that I found in that philosophy article, like, oh yeah, sex robots will solve this issue completely. Um, 
then if there's only one person who can fulfill the duty without breaking the rules, that's, that's more pressure. <laughs> it's just more pressure. You I, know? I don't know. I, I it's just... more pressure. And also like you're by being in the monogamous relationship, not only are you the only person who can fulfill the duty, you're the one enforcing the fact that they can't yeah. fulfill it anywhere like else. You would, you yeah, would better, you might argue, you know, not, that, but I, you know, I don't like this argument to begin with because I don't think you should enforce that exclusivity in the first place. I, I yeah. don't really see it. It's like a need that someone is fulfilling though. Like I more see it as an energy between people, mm-hmm. which I, I guess it's your argument still holds because eventually the other the, person the, might the not person, see it that way. You could see it as energy like, like between the, the energy, They might see it as a need of yours they have to fulfill, you know? Well, I think if that happens, then something has gone wrong. Yeah. 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 I mean, but I mean, yeah, the idea of sexual human strength is like addressing something that's gone wrong, like, like, in a marriage where the sex life is falling apart. And it's like, well, it, it's part like of being committed to that relationship is being committed to maintaining the sex life. I mean, that's enshrined in a lot of law, actually. That's like grounds for divorce. And whatever. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of both or like that dichotomy you drew between a need versus an energy between people. Like, I think it's a need that people have that is fulfilled really by an energy between people. But yeah. like, I think it's pretty natural for most people to crave that, even if they're not experiencing that energy right now. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, I find for me, if I'm not experiencing that energy, that energy with anyone, it's like, it's hard to have desire without an object. Like, there'll still be like, it'll almost be like my mind will like, almost like, like, grope for like some outside person yeah. to have a crush on or something. So I can like, cleanse your palate. Yeah, or just, just mentally imagine something. Yeah. Yeah, like your mind searches searches for objects because there's something in it that wants <laughs> that. I just wanted to say too, uh, like just in this conversation, it was striking me like when we're talking about, I don't remember what you called it, like communal sexual strength. Is that what it was? Communal strength is the phrase. Sec- yeah. Sexual communal strength. I don't know what the situation is in Canada, but up until the 90s, marital rape wasn't, a divine, a defined thing, or even illegal in a lot of states. So we're like the idea that you don't have this obligation, like in a legal sense, is really, really new, at least in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really disturbing yeah. fact. And obviously, it plays into all of the incel discourse. Yeah, it plays into all the incel discourse, and also I think it just, like, I think it's really normal that we're at least me and Ariel and like society right now is kind of conflicted about marriage and monogamy and polyamory and relationship anarchy. Marriage is great. (laughs) (laughs) That's interesting. Actually, there are a lot of relationship anarchists who would say that you couldn't be a relationship anarchist and married. Well, I would prefer it if the state weren't involved in marriage, but you know, we're not, but that, that's, you know, as soon as you have to work with government institutions that you technically think shouldn't exist. Right. But like, I, I think that there's a lot of people, I, I wouldn't be one of them, so I can't make this ar- argument too well, but there's a lot of people that would say that by marrying someone, you are creating a hierarchy that's defined, like it's a, it's a forever commitment and it's kind of an inherently unjust hierarchy. You're elevating that relationship I, above all I'm others. Perfectly just, not above all others necessarily. I mean, if we have a child, I won't necessarily elevate my partner above our child right yeah um, for example you know um i mean we, we talk a lot about the importance of commitment i think it's just a, a very formal kind of commitment um you know. yeah i think it's i think it's cool i'm i'm, I'm for it i just thought i should voice that <laughs> yeah well i think it, it's, it's great for the predictability and trust you know to this notion you know and you know it's a reason that you do it publicly is for accountability and you know because if you know obviously no one's I met somebody once who was like, uh, there was somebody I didn't recognize, and they were like, "This is my fiance," and I was like, "Oh, wow!" <laughs> <laughs> I that's what I naturally, and I found out later, yeah, they were engaged. You know, oh, wow. So, <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> and, you know, um, you know, that's why you know, marriages are in public for like the accountability of saying, like, you know, this is what I'm committed. You know, well, you know the things that people say when they get married. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, th- and I think um, none of that is particularly tied to the concept of exclusivity. I mean, you know, 
people were married to the church and it was a, a monotheistic church. There was some, uh, actually you got into this in the Verveki episode with the connection between monotheism and monogamy, um, which to me is reflected in the fact that like atheism was one of my first anarchisms and then like, you know, relationship anarchy came later, you know. Um, to me, they're very closely tied, although I'm not sure I can say exactly how, but yeah. <clears throat> well, it, well, monotheism. Just mono thinking in general is part of it. But it's a bit more than that. Well, mono thing, monotheism. There's this idea that like monotheism is the form of forms, right? Mm, yeah. What so, all the gods have in common. Yeah. So it's a, it's the it's the you abstract away from everything. So what about what's good about Zeus and Hera and it, so on? Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the ultimate abstraction of of good and truth, and it's, that, that definitely seems linked to the idea that there is. But you like can't romanticism. There's a good and true partner. An abstraction. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, but you you can date. It, it definitely it definitely relates to this idea. Actually, sorry, you should There's there's the one. There's 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 right. There is truth. <laughs> there is right. There is good. There is the one. Yeah, actually, I misspoke. You can date an abstraction. You just really shouldn't. Like you can just like date your conception of who somebody is because they they need to be somebody who like is the ideal of like every other partner you've had or something like that. I don't In think that's. Way, I don't like, think that's how it is. Like the way I would see it, I guess oh, the way nice. I would justify that that way of seeing it would be. If I have an understanding of myself that is in some way unified, like a novel, like a unified story about myself, mm -hmm. and the idea that there is like um, a unique way to complement, there's there's a unique complement to that, or a unique, yeah, a unique complement to that. That we found another person. So again, I don't know if I follow that. The two stories complement each other, like people's narratives. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that's a good metaphor, actually. It, there is a there is a way I am. There is a way things are. There is a right person who has. There there is a right person. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so it's like saying there is a monotheistic god. Like there yeah. is the yeah. god who, because like I mean, so, I, okay, look, suppose like the Greek gods really existed, hmm. and the Christian god didn't, right? And like the Greek gods are a little more physically imaginable, <sighs> like superheroes or something. Right. And uh, and there's also Batman, whatever. But so like these like demigod type figures exist, but like the theoretical God that has all of their virtues doesn't actually exist. I mean, this is close to the atheist perspective. It's just that instead of demigods, we just have that, that there are some people who are like morally more virtuous or something, um, but not by as big a difference as you have in like the Greek stories of like these like beings who are way more powerful. They're actually not more virtuous, they're more powerful. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of them are virtuous. I don't know, are there any virtuous Greek gods? Like, like, are actually like, oh, what would Zeus do? Like, not what you no. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and There no. were ones that like, I don't know, the abstraction like, wouldn't really be there. Like the, the Greek gods could really be there and the abstraction not exist just because the Greek, the fact that the Greek gods were real wouldn't make the Christian God real, right? And the fact right. that all of the goodness and all the people you've ever dated doesn't make your theoretical future soulmate who has all of the good of every relationship you've ever had in them. But it's and not necessarily like that. No, it's not. I think you, would, I think you kind of have to believe in, in a God to believe in a soulmate, right? Like that uh, there is a person for you that's that doesn't seem like something that would happen from a like naturalistic atheist. You, you, do, you do need to believe in both. And then both what? ideas are very popular. These okay. both, both ideas are very unpopular. These I, days. I have to tell you both. It's interesting you say that because for years I was an atheist who believed in soulmates. So, interesting. Yeah. How yeah. did that work? I don't know. I stopped believing in God first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> took a while but like, did you, did you have know. like a, did you have a framework for soulmates where it like made sense naturalistically that there would be like, well, I guess, well, I guess, like, if, if you buy the argument that, like, some people are better for you than others. Look, look I was like, an atheist. I, mean, I, was a, I was scientific. Like, I, I you know, I, I was, I, I, I've grown up with, uh, uh, you know, like, a Christian family and hippie mother's trip, trippy humility about, like, the nature of the universe. Like, 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 from both perspectives, I got the message of, like, okay. we don't actually know what's going on. And certainly after being to university, I know for sure we don't know what's going on. <laughs> Okay. like you know like how how quickly it bottoms out when you try to like get some authority to tell you what's really going on with the universe you know that's true we, we could resurrect aristotle himself and still understand metaphysics you know so. that's true i was being uncreative like maybe you could have like quantum entanglement with another person but like the idea of a soulmate to me is this is the is a unique person that you love forever and always did like it's an eternal uh unique love 
Hmm. And, and it, not not in this in the sense of being different from impossible love, in the sense that there is it, there's only one of them. There, for me, it was tied up with the idea of past lives. Yeah, right, right, right. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I got this mix of like Christianity from my grandparents and all this like New Age stuff from my mother. And it's like, oh yeah, reincarnation and blah blah blah. And like, I don't know. It was mm. um um it, it's it's um the metaphysics of love are really up for grabs. I think it's it's like. Because on the one hand, it seems like people try to tell you like, oh, well, you'll know, you'll know, like when they're the one. It's like, well, what if they disagree? <laughs> and you think, uh, people think, you know, like, it turns out that like, you can't just be romantic about like, believe in your intuitions, because that's actually not. Very well, you, you still can, you just have to romanticize unrequited love. <laughs> okay, how do I do that, Ariel? Or you can say oh, that you were wrong. I can write the book on doing that, Adam. Really? How romantic is that book really going to be? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you could say that you you could say that you were wrong too, right? Like, couldn't you just say, well, yeah. "Oh, I thought I knew, but I didn't know myself well enough. I was wrong. I was young. I'm wrong about things all the time." That's the, the, yeah. then you, you then eventually you start to question the whole meta structure. I guess the first time that yeah. happens, you can do that. Yeah, I guess this is a different way of tying it all to skepticism, right? Because like, I don't know, like people are craving certainty of of some kind, and there is this idea that that after the death of god people turn to romance to try to fill the void and like yeah up the ante on the romance game or something they're like well you know there's no god but like you know we all know like romance is meaningful and like sure so it certainly is but it doesn't mean that, like you know we can use it for all kinds of meaning i i don't know i mean it's it's hard it's hard because like i also don't like the, the fungibility argument plenty of fish in the sea oh yeah and, and I have found in my life, like maybe more of a Greek God type thing, but like every really, like, really intense relationship I've been in, I like it, it, it's never, there's always been some important, imp important elements of it or important dimensions of the feeling that haven't, haven't repeated. Hmm. Repeated from one relationship to the next. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, I think it's easy to think that like you like we really like the hmm. I guess the, the the times I've been in love and the times I've had really intense relationships ha have been special and haven't been repeatable or fungible with other relationships. Which is which is part of the reason that like the idea of like a science of relationships is a little dubious because science is about what's repeatable. Yeah, it's true. It's also well for me that's a a reason to be skeptical of the one also right like i've had a similar experience like with my really really intense relationships that i've never been able to reach the level of this kind of intimacy with anyone else as i have with this one person and like same for other people and i guess if you believed in the one you could be looking for the one person who fulfills all of it and is greater at everything than all of those people yeah. but i don't think that's true i think that there are multiple people out there with which you can reach great heights and there'll be different kind of heights, kinds of heights because your two beings will work together in different ways. It's, well, it's, it's funny. I, I, used, I used to think of something that had a result kind of like that, but it was in a more guilt inducing way because it was the sense of like the one is somebody that you're expected to be able to promise that you'll never fall in love with somebody else too. So you have to know somehow that you can, promise them what you're going to feel in the future about other people <laughs> and, and and suppose you meet somebody where you think yeah i could promise them that you know i that i wouldn't um want to switch you know you know because it's because people don't just want you to stay because you're ob obligated they want you to want to stay yeah so they're like you know will you always love me will you always want to stay in this relationship and you might find a relationship where you think you can honestly say that yeah i think i will always want to stay in this relationship or even i promise you i know i'm always that's not just that i'm going to do it but that i i can tell you that i'm going to want it and you know um you might think after that relationship dissolves that like it it becomes that harder much harder to say that to another person and as time goes on the whole idea starts to wear thin of like that's what you're supposed to be looking for is somebody that you can promise you'll never have a promise to that you'll never have eyes for somebody else that's not what the one is though that's not what the one is it's in not, my view it's, it's, it's not it's, 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 like, it's not about the expectations of the idea that i found gave way go ahead for, for, for me it's not about finding one person to love forever or to be with forever it's about it's about 
either defining or discovering the meaning of, of my life. Like if I define the meaning of my life as being like leaving home and gaining independence, then like there's a particular relationship that went along with that story. And I would say that person was the one, or if I say my life was about, um, you know, this existential crisis I had and, you know, this, this, the story that happened at this time in my life, then I would identify a different relationship as being. Oh, wow. The, the, the one. And if we say there's no one, it just seems like in some way. There's a phrase I'm trying to remember. For saying like there's no meaning or, or that meaning is, is, doesn't, is it, it unindexed? Well, is there a, a most meaningful moment of your life or a defining story of your life? And if so, does that, I, I think it's another assumption that you would need to experience it with your romantic partner. Well, not necessarily, because you could say that not everyone has a one. Well, but like, what if, are you saying that you couldn't have a one if the most profound moment of your life was on the mountain alone? So that means you don't have a one? I mean, I'd say that like, probably that's the case with Nietzsche. <laughs> and that uh, he, he was just falling in love with himself <laughs> he was an incel yeah um we can separate the fate question from the uniqueness part because you might believe in fate but that you're fated to meet three people in sequence let's say so it's not even mm -hmm. simultaneous polyamory like my right. fate was to meet person a and then meet and some people do believe that about their past and the, I, I'm trying to remember a phrase. I forget it was like karmic partner or something, but I, I saw it in a meme once. And it was like, oh, your soulmate is the person who you're fated to do this with. And your other person is the person you're fated to do this with first. <laughs> yeah. And work up all your shit with them. And I, yeah. it's, I think it's actually an old concept that, that makes it right or something. I forget where they were getting it from. It was like some other religious tradition that I'm not, not remembering. Yeah. It, it was I a funny I... notion. And then once you do that, you're like, oh, okay, well, maybe... Like what if you know? What if your life is the plot of Friends, and that was all fated to happen? You know, like Chandler was fated to see Monica that time, and I don't know. Everybody slept with everybody in that show, I believe. So, uh, well, sorry, all the heterosexual pairings. <laughs> Pardon me. It's a family show here. Jeez. Um, but you know, so imagine that was your story. Way more complicated than just soulmate and your karmic partner, whatever it's called. Um, but you could think that's all fated, and that's you know how it was all supposed to happen. Or you might think that exactly half of it was fated, and half of it was like contrary to fate, or some of it was just noise and could have gone either way. You might think only some of your relationships are fated. Um, you know, I I'm very agnostic of all of that mm. personally. Um, I know that I I often uh, feel like I uh, know something, and I could very well be wrong. You know, and and um, it's like either I am wrong or other people uh, are lying to me or something <laughs> about you know, whether they, it's like, it's like, imagine if your soulmate knew that they were your soulmate, but decided not to tell you and be like, no, no, I'm not your soulmate. You know? Why would they do <laughs> that? <laughs> well, they were no worse for They were soulmate. really like, angry. They like playing pranks and that's what you love. And <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's like a, Fair you know, an eternal prank. But for yeah. Eternity, your soulmate is like denying that they're your soulmate or something. I mean, um, the point being that like, Look, I, I think we should be pluralist in our epistemology. Like we don't really know where knowledge is supposed to come from. Like the scientific method is one thing and it's good for certain kinds of predictions and all that. But like, we don't really know how important our like felt experience, our intuitions, our romantic feelings are for determining what conclusions we should reach, you know? Um, and uh, I think we have to really keep an open mind uh, because I think it's, it's, um, it's really not obvious. Like if someone can tell from the way they feel that something is more faded than something else you know so, because certainly people have thought they could feel that and if they think that why do they think that if it's not true so, so i actually had an experience um where i met somebody and there were a bunch of strange coincidences about how we met and like we had all these connections to the past and to our childhood and stuff and in a completely different location mm -hmm. and then that same day we shared a near-death experience and then we shared like a deep psychedelic trip, which like altered my political views forever, but we didn't fall in love. Like, like we felt close and we like explored it a little bit, but we didn't fall in love. And I had multiple people argue to me like, Katie, like that's your soulmate. Like you're <laughs> faded, you know, like you gotta, <laughs> you know, it was my you gotta go after this one. Yeah. <laughs> You've been your soulmate though, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to fall in love and end up with that person. 
Well, okay. Well, maybe you just but have a bunch of soulmates. Paul yeah. Like, you know? Right? Yeah. I just mean, like, that's like, when you were talking about the setup for the one, like, what you experienced, the most profound thing, like, you, you, you discover the meaning of life, and that's with this person, and, and that's your one, and, like, that's what it means to have a one, like, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll probably have other really profound experiences in my life, but, like, like, that seemed like the perfect setup for the one, and it, it wasn't, and I'm very much okay with that. Perfect just, setup? Is it really the perfect setup? Because, like, what would have happened for the rest of your life after that setup if it was, like, a lifelong kind of one? Like, how do you fill uh, in the that story in, like, the karmic perfect way? You know, like, just, like, literally anything. Well, we would have, yeah, I guess we would have ha had to have been, like, different or more compatible people for that to have been, like, actually the perfect setup. I don't know. I might have like a relationship anarchist conception of the one because I don't I don't see it as necessarily linked to to, to to ending up with the person or anything like that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I think what we're sort of wrestling around here is that there's different um, ways to talk about faded connections and we don't really have like standard terminology for it and like that. But like, I think I think I think the idea that like you have exactly one faded connection is kind of like, like why would fate be so simple? Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with that. But I think that, and so if there are faded connections, they probably can take on a lot of different forms. Um, it, it sounds like we're all just sort of speaking from the perspective of kind of assuming that they exist, which is, you know, I think it's actually a better way to live than assuming that like none of your connections are faded. Like what if one of them is like, just in case. <laughs> well, I, actually, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't assume fate, but I think I live as if I don't believe in fate, actually. Mm. Yes, yeah, yeah. This is more of a advocating. A, I often advocate variants of like a secular Pascal's wager, mm -hmm. and you know, like, what if the universe is it actually is trippy? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what 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 if like just what I want in the middle of the night actually does make a difference for the cosmos? You know, like, yeah, it's, it's it certainly makes a difference to me. I'm part of the cosmos, so. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, guess I, I guess I'm kind of agnostic about fate and those things. So. Well, I mean, yeah, Pascal's wager is, is like, like probability is all about decision making under uncertainty, right? So right. You know, I'm agnostic too. Um, I just, uh, uh, I'm not completely agnostic about the argument of Pascal's wager. <laughs> right, right. Uh, like it's, you're better off, you're better off living as if it is true if you think that there's a strong enough possibility that it is yeah i don't think it actually works for the christian deity but i think it works for more generic concepts like meaningfulness or like is there fate or that kind of thing yeah well i, yeah, I can get behind that you can get I, I, I guess i do see drawbacks to it to live it which i haven't having is... having usually lived with a strong belief that fate and meaning and all that stuff are real mm. but you get like over it becomes like a tank it's kind of even get tangled up in like the spider's web of like this is also faded <laughs> this also has to be like this is like your your existing belief system yeah well and you're also assuming that you can identify fate and meaning in the moment you're doing that <sighs> yeah I mean, yeah i guess you can get addicted to the perception of meaning you know like artificially artificial dopamine highs create one kind of meaning i guess like maybe serotonin is a different one you know what i mean like there's different ways to get that feeling of like, oh, things are meaningful and this is faded. And yeah, you have to trust in your intuition in a certain way, or at least in in the whole system, in your ability to like connect your emotions and intuition with some kind of rational epistemology. I guess you're right. I guess you have to trust it in some way. I mean, I didn't really frame it that way in my mind. I guess of like trust. I mean, I I thought more. In other, I thought in other cases whether I trust my intuition or not. It's like. I mean, what's the alternative to trusting your intuition anyway? I mean, just like accepting like a mundane scientific description of like evolution and love and like, well, basically you need to maximize fitness in the next generation. You can do some math to figure out who you should date actually. Uh, <laughs> 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 if you want to maximize the chance of like uh, more than half of your genome making it more than 50 generations down the line, sir, just to buy our product. And, <laughs> And, uh, you know, PS will screen for genetic disorders and anything that's like, you know, to, um, would destabilize society as it currently is. So, you know, 
don't have too many radical beliefs allowed in your offspring. Oh, did we say that our product is funded by the current state? <laughs> 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 sorry just getting a little dystopian there no yeah, that was fun uh, yeah, yeah was sorry fun. i should i should probably get going i'm getting really hungry so, yeah. oh, great i've just been eating you. chocolate truffles <laughs> uh, <laughs> great to talk to you too yeah i think we had a good conversation i think we made some progress yeah, yeah. Great. this is really interesting yeah i agree i I can't wait to ask all my exes what I got wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, my exes are not seeing this one. Oh goodness. I wonder if my exes are seeing this one. That's weird. I'm sure some of them are like, really, this guy's giving people advice? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. Please. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> Hey, I'll, I'll listen to their advice if they put it on YouTube. May none of our exes Google us. Or they can send okay. it to me directly. <laughs> Yeah, because nobody ever Googles their exes. Never. <laughs> That's true. I assume my exes Google me way less than I Google them. Well, I'm still very open-minded. I'm Facebook friends with most of my exes, so it's like, it's very, they'll, they'll see stuff. Yeah. But this is bonus footage, so we would know if one of our exes was to subscribe. Probably, probably. Depends we know where this footage ends this. up. You never know. That's true. Ah! Well, let's just say hi in case. Okay, yeah, hi, hi, hi exes. Peace. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> Peace. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.